Good morning, everybody. We're live. Welcome to a happy uh, Thursday morning, breaking through the disruption webinar series brought on, brought to you by Minnesota Real Estate Journal, Grand Bridge Real Estate Capital, and Bridgewater Bank. Uh, we're going to start off by uh, thanking all of our speakers. I'm going to go through who we've got online with us, and uh, then we'll get started. First off, we've got Dave Rasmussen, Senior Vice President, Grand Bridge Real Estate Capital. Mark Vanelli, Executive Vice President, Bellwether Enterprise Real Estate Capital. Murray Kornberg, Executive Vice President, Doherty Funding, LLC. Joel Torberg, Senior Vice President, Managing Director, CBRE Capital Markets. Welcome, guys, and thanks for coming along. Uh, let's start with uh, a, just an update on where we're at. Uh, so real quick, just what's going on in the market and what are you doing right now? Well, I'll start. Uh, I'm up in the upper corner, uh, just that fielding calls from clients, just trying to stay close and listening and, you know, hoping our servicing people can handle all the calls. Uh, I'll go. I'll go next. I think uh, uh, Dave hit on a very good point there is that, you know, in times of disruption in the market, you know, where intermediaries like this group uh, can be most effective is by being available to their clients, their borrowers, uh, in, uh, lenders, uh, and be a source of sharing and providing market intelligence and market information. What I, you know, I think from experience, all of us on this panel lived through, you know, what happened in 2008 and 2009 and thereafter, the great financial crisis. And, you know, before then, 9-11, some of us were around for the Russian bond meltdown in 98. Um, and uh, I think in times of stress, you know, people need information more than anything. And so one of the things that I've been doing is just touching base with my clients and lenders and being an available source of information uh, for them, uh, which is helpful. Uh, I have, I, I do have three hotel deals that I've been working on. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about asset classes, I'm sure, as we get going here. Uh, but uh, I can tell you, hotel deals are not the most fun uh, transactions to be working on right now. But uh, anyway, that's, that's what I've been up to. Yeah, likewise, I think Dave and Murray hit it on the head with respect to how we're trying to navigate this with our days. And I was on a national call yesterday where we met as uh, as uh, regional managers where we discussed how we might be able to uh, provide more assistance on a high touch basis to our client base, as Murray said, where that is extraordinarily important right now to be uh, communicable and make sure that the uh, by our borrowers are fully aware of how you know we would recommend and suggest they they pursue any of their uh, you know the current issues that are affecting their property so without question that's become the priority and then number two uh, try to balance a delicate balance of seeing if there is in fact uh, new business to be done and uh, we can talk about that as well during the program. Yeah, I'm gonna echo the same thing, trying to figure out how to provide value for clients. I think we've lost Joel, oh. Todd. No, oh, he's there. Oh, there he is. Are you guys hearing him? Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Now we can. Oh, okay. Sorry, technical difficulties again. Uh, well, we I'd, we just I'd broke echo. through two hundred people online, so we may have <laughs> yeah. some connection issues, but we're good. Uh, I guess I'd echo the same thing that the, the three of you stated, and trying to figure out how we can provide value for clients when there isn't specifically a deal to work on. Advise them what we're seeing in the market, and then it seems like I've been on so many. Uh, Zoom national calls to talk about how the agencies are handling forbearance. Uh, it's a very fluid process, talking to a lot of lenders, just trying to figure out uh, how the market's evolving because it's evolving so quickly and try and relay that to, to clients. And uh, again, try and provide as much market information as we can right now and help groups make decision 
impacts. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start to see on the forbearance issue, we'll probably get into that more. Uh, the agencies obviously announced that they're, they're open to it. Uh, the next uh, yesterday and, you know, through April 5th is going to tell a, a pretty big story about, you know, how, how many groups are, are, how many renters are not able to make their payments and things like that on the multifamily side. Okay, it looks like we have a lot of people online. Everybody's managed to get on. We're uh, closing in on 300. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. I want to do a couple of housekeeping items before we dig into the presentation. First one is on your screen, you should see some settings to the right or below. If you're on your cell phone, it's going to be below this picture. If it's uh, on a laptop or desktop, you're going to be to the right. Find the button that says polls and... I'm going to start a new poll. Whoop, that's the wrong one. Uh, okay, you know what? We're going to go to chat. Next slide. Find the chat button. You'll see a question at the top. If you have a pet who is happy, you are working from home, what is his or her name? Uh, so pop that one on, and then we can uh, start to share information there. If you have connection issues, uh, first, try a web, different web browser. A lot of people are having good luck with um, Chrome, Google Chrome, but uh, if, if another one works, give it a try. And then there's a reconnect button above on your screen. Uh, with the, all of that said, Dave, let's get into your slides, if you wouldn't mind. Dave Rasmussen's prepared some slides, and we're going to have him kind of go through and start us off. Great. Thank you. So I'm uh, with the Minneapolis office uh, remotely in the Prairie of Eden. And um, so we're commercial real estate investment bankers. Uh, we raise debt and equity for our clients. It's just a little bit about us. Uh, we're now the sixth, our parent is now the sixth largest bank in the country called Truist after the merger of Grant, uh, BB&T and SunTrust. So uh, just a quick outline of a couple of topics I'm going to touch on. So to recap, so this is uh, done about 10 days ago. We had a little practice one where we had 50 people online. But uh, just to recap what happened at the MBA, <clears throat> we meet every year. It's more money than last year. And uh, it was a great year last year. Excuse me. <clears throat> And so the chief investment officers of the life companies are telling us uh, they're allocating between bonds and mortgages and the mortgages get, get more. So over those two and a half days, we have about 20 meetings. And so, uh, you know, the running joke has always been that uh, the mortgage guys, if they run out of money during the year, they'll just take it from the bond guys because spreads over corporates our, our corporate bonds were trading 50 to 100 basis points over treasuries. They could get a couple hundred basis points over treasuries for mortgages. So this kind of reminded me of a story. About 25 years ago, my daughter was uh, doing about a, 100 modeling jobs and TV commercials. And uh, the money she was earning was going into her uh, 529 plan. So one time she said, uh, Dad, I'd like to you know, keep this shoot and buy some stuff for school. And I said, okay, let's, let's do that. So she gets through the shoot and it's later in the day. She finally calls me and she starts screaming. Uh, I get to keep the money. I get to keep the money. I said, yeah, but that's what we agreed to. But I get to keep the money. So wh why are we going back through this? And she said, it's turned into a two day shoot and I'm going to get over a thousand bucks. No, no. <laughs> I said, no, just the 125 for the one hour deal. So it kind of reminds me of the life company bond guys. Well, these are traders on the floor. I, I figured a picture of uh, guys looking at monitors at their desks probably wouldn't be uh, as exciting. But the bond guys right now at life companies have seen spreads uh, blow out. And so what's happening is uh, they get to keep the money. So recently we had a life company tell us that uh, they saw uh, investment grade liquid bond blow out over 190 over the treasury, which got them an almost a 3% yield. So that begs the question, if, if they can, if they can uh, buy these liquid uh, investment grade bonds 
at three, how do you price an illiquid non-rated commercial mortgage? So is this a temporary or a permanent pricing model? Uh, luckily, uh, we already got an update from that lender and said that recently spreads have come back in due to relief that's been passed. So this looks promising for mortgages. And I think as things settle down, we'll see that uh, lenders will come back to the market. They're sitting on a ton of cash. It can't go all go into bonds. Those, those spreads are coming back in and we'll see uh, stabilization in the, uh, on the life side. So finally, April's here. And I think that's important because everybody wants to see everybody make their payments, whether it's rent or mortgages. And lenders uh, will listen, but they'd like you to keep your payments current. So if our recommendation, make your payments and then start documenting how are your residents doing in your multifamily projects? How are your... Um, tenants doing in your properties, get them to give you detailed uh, statements, make a formal request if you are seeking for some relief or forbearance, and just understand that the servicing people are getting slammed, not only from the lender side as they try to put together a game plan, but they're getting slammed from the borrower side. You know, our company, we've got $70 billion of mortgages that are servicing and you can only imagine the thousands of loans that are out there and the requests that are coming in prior to even making their first April payment. So um, it needs to be, I think, a considerate, logical request. It needs to be in writing. And it has to include a lot of these things that we've listed here because lenders aren't just going to take a phone call and say, ah, you're right. You know, let's, let's just skip the next four months of payments and uh, we'll get back to you. So one of the local banks uh, I've been talking with, um, you know, they, they were uh, notified by the OCC that said, work with your clients. If some of them need to get some IO, that would be great. If the, you need to for, uh, do some forbearance and tack those payments on the end of the loan payments, we'll work with you on that. We're not going to ding the quality of your book of business. But again, every lender, every loan is a separate case. There's, I don't believe that there's a, a blanket solution to everybody's problems. And I had just mentioned to the guys uh, prior to us getting online that we just got notice yesterday of a life insurance company that went through and to all their retail loans, automatically just converted all their loans to IO for the next four months in advance before and they've maybe I'm sure have gotten some calls, but uh, even before some had made the request, they just decided to make all their retail loans interest only for the next four months to give them some relief and uh, some confidence that their lender is going to work with them. So looking at the four food groups, multifamily is still, still on top. We'll see how collections go, but our belief is that uh, many will be making their payments. Uh, but then on uh, student housing and senior housing, those are going to be uh, scrutinized much more. Industrial, just love it. Can't find enough of it. You just can't put out the money that's, that you can in multifamily. And what can you say about office? <laughs> We're all calling from home. This could be the 9-11 event for, for office. This will change how we work and dine and interact going forward. And retail, you know, we wanted that anti-Amazon retail, things like restaurants and salons and fitness centers. Oh, wait, those are changing. And then uh, again, yesterday, in speaking with a lender, their client owns 5,000 hotel rooms. Their occupancy for March was 9%. That was an eye-opener to hear that number. But... It makes sense. So just a couple of quick stories. I had a client at the end of 19, well, probably even in the third quarter of 19. I was begging them to give me information because rates were falling and they had, a, they had a restaurant and a salon center and a fitness center and they got us the information here in March. So that deal is now on the sides. 
And then, uh, again, we had another borrower that thought that treasuries were falling, and that's correct. They did. I think the 10 years probably 60 basis points or less. I mean, just incredibly low. But we didn't forecast that spreads were going to blow up. So he wants to wait. And then from appraisers, they can inspect the properties. Uh, before, they were limited to units that they could walk into. But now they're sheltered at home. So we're seeing new clauses inserted into appraisals that may affect uh, valuations. So as, as we're looking for new transactions, I think they have to be right down the fairway and low loan to value. And you have to be patient because not only are lenders dealing with every, every loan in their portfolio, they're re-quoting every deal that they've been talking about for the last month. So to get yourself in order, work on your schedule of real estate owned, know how things are performing. You're going to be asked, what are your collections at your properties? And uh, be able to document everything. And I think the key phrase for lenders always has been, has the borrower performed as agreed to? And now the question I'm getting from, from borrowers are, has a lender performed as agreed to? And then again, yesterday, speaking with a banker about a, a new construction mini perm, he said, we're going to start using seven to 10% vacancy factors and a lower loan to cost. So start putting that into your underwriting as we, uh, as we do submissions. How long will this last? My comments are nobody wanted to be the last to close. Nobody will want to be the first to open. The liability is too great. I think in the Midwest, we have a much better chance of getting up and going. Unfortunately, I think this continues to go longer than we expect. So we hope for the best and we plan, we plan for the worst. Let's, uh, let's get other opinions on that real quick, Dave. I'm going to leave your slide up here with your contact info, but on this, how long is it going to last? Um, anybody else want to jump in? And, and I had a conversation with a um, long story, but uh, somebody last night who said it's going to be a while. And I said, when you mean a while, do you mean hours, days, weeks, months, years? What does a while mean to you? Um, no one's really wanted to put their number, a number to it, but what do we think? How long are we going to be in our houses? Are we going to get out April 12th, like uh, the president said, or are we going to be here for a while? Anybody want to chime in? Well, I don't, I don't think anybody on this panel is qualified to estimate or guesstimate when, when that's going to happen. But what we, what we probably would be able to do is tie into this, uh, what we do for a living in terms of financing or providing capital for commercial real estate and how long we think we want to plan for uh, uh, the, you know, the eventuality of getting through this. Um, I think that, you know, we should without question assume that we're going to be talking about this or seeing our way out of it, uh, not, not until the fall. So, I think without one should be very conservative in thinking about their forecasting and what they're going to do during this time frame. But it's, it, it occurs to me that with where we're at timing wise in terms of uh, our social distancing and shelter in place um, and what we think will be timing from the standpoint of getting test kits that would allow somebody to know whether they're safe going out uh, and even then whether that'll be a possibility. So when weighing that in conjunction with what, you know, would be absent revenues in all these different properties, I can't imagine somebody should be thinking about this without putting that time frame toward the end of the year. <laughs> I've got a graph here. This is from Minnesota Department of Health. Um, I've had to watch this really closely, and I know you made a good comment that none of us are really qualified. Um, I don't know who is in this time frame. Um, everybody's got a different opinion. But I've been watching this Minnesota Department of Health website every day. And if you look, the this line graph jumping up is kind of misleading. But what you look, what I've been following is these green 
bars below with how many new cases do we have every day. And you see a period of like eight days here where it's sort of stayed around the same. And I think people are waiting for that to start to go down before they want to talk about relaxing things. The question I have is uh, if they start to relax some of these restrictions, will it jump up again? Um, and so I think, I, you know, going back to your comment, Mark, um, you know, do we end up going till fall? I don't know. With restaurants closed and stuff, that would be really damaging to the economy. Anybody else have any thoughts on how long we're going to be in this? Uh, I think I, this is Murray. I think Mark was probably talking about, you know, focusing in on when this group of practitioners might say to their clients that we would return to a more normalized lending environment uh, or an opportunity to continue to do business the way we were, you know, before uh, coronavirus. And I, I actually agree with Mark. I think we're, you know, Q3, uh, Q4, uh, the underlying presumption is that there has been some positive move in whatever metric you choose to evaluate uh, the, the positive effects of maintaining and containing the virus. Um, and there's going to be a prime the pump phase uh, after which some sort of return to normalcy. I, I do believe that, you know, if we go back to the outline of questions, I do believe that for deals that have been in progress, from what I've seen for the deals that I'm working on and my team is working on, I think there is some effort on the part of lenders to try and figure out a way within the confines of what they're trying to get done on their side, figure out a way to try and keep these deals moving forward to the extent possible. I mean, we closed a life insurance company loan 10 days ago uh, that had been in process for some time. And certainly if there was ever a reason why a lender could have invoked whatever provisions there are in the loan agreement or the mortgage uh, that had been negotiated in order to delay or defer, defer or change the terms of uh, funding, they could have done so and didn't. Uh, so I think there's a legitimate effort on the part of folks to try and get deals closed to the extent that they're closable or move them along through credit process to the extent that they're movable. Uh, but if we're talking about a return to normal transaction activity, uh, I agree with Mark. I think we're probably Q3, Q4. You know, I, I'd agree. The, uh, you know, the quick recovery that we saw in or that we're seeing in China gives kind of everybody hope that we can have the same type of rebound. But at the same time, this is such a fluid process and they haven't seen anything like it that we just kind of keep extending things. We're, we're hopeful. But, uh, you know, groups like I've seen Goldman Sachs, Mor Morgan Stanley's expectations, you know, three weeks ago were that we were going to see you know, negative teens in uh, GDP for, for the second quarter. Now those have been revised and they're in 30 to the mid 30s negative. Right. So I think we just keep the longer we're in, we keep stretching out these, these expectations and initially it was for positive recovery in, in the in the third quarter. And I think most groups are still envisioning that. Uh, but when you look at the positive recovery, that just starts to be positive off if their forecasts are right, this huge drop. So w when is back to back to normal and back to where GDP was? I mean, it still could be a while with that with that large drop. Now, sitting here talking about real estate, I think most people take a long-term look at, at real estate and theoretically coming out of this, I think the one thing that we theoretically should see is continued low treasuries. And as the risk premiums start to normalize and become lower, uh, theoretically we could see low interest rates that will really help real estate uh, through whatever type of downturn that we're seeing. So it still feels like a good sector to be in. Uh, 2008 and nine, in hindsight, didn't, you know, we, we made it through, we had a big positive run, but when we were in it, it was extremely painful. And theoretically, because of how quickly we've gone down, uh, we can recover, uh, not just as quickly, but, uh, 
more quickly and not have a total uh, negative period as, as long as we had in the last downturn. And you, you have to look at some of the underlying positives here. The balance sheets of, of the banks and the lenders are strong to withstand this. So the financial crisis that we went last time, it, it, it needed longer to repair itself uh, you know, really from the top down. And uh, I guess dodging a timing question, I think it's probably going to get pushed out till the fourth quarter, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the big the catchphrase people are using maybe is not catchphrase, but is it a V recovery or is it a U recovery? So anybody else want to comment real quick? Do we think V? Or, you know, Joel, you said it's going to get pretty deep, so maybe the only shape it can be is a V. But uh, are we talking V recovery or U recovery? Or I've heard a new uh, the Nike swoosh is also a a recovery that I've heard where you've got the deep drop and then you have a long sustained. Uh, recovery period that's not as as sharp uh, upwards as as it had been. I like it like a hockey stick. Yeah, for us Minnesotans. Mm-hmm. Well, let's jump in the now to what if I had a loan in process? Or I, I was just in the middle of a deal. Either you can talk about early stage and we were near funding, or I'm in the middle of construction draws. What are some of the lenders saying right now on on deals in progress? Um, I, I, I can take one part of that. Uh, I'm working on a deal right now where we had um, an expression of interest. This is a, a bank deal for new construction for multifamily uh, bank deal uh, that we had gotten expression of interest. Uh, the client uh, needed a little bit more time to finalize their institutional uh, capital equity uh, raise, uh, uh, which got done uh, in the course of the last three weeks. Uh, so that was somewhat encouraging uh, that there are equity institutional equity investors out there that are looking past and through today's environment because, you know, we're talking about a deal that will commence construction sometime in the summer, let's just say, and take 18 months to build. And some amount of time thereafter to stabilize. And so they're looking, as Joel said, you know, with the long perspective. Um, So once the equity got figured out, we went back to the bank who had been uh, treading water. The loan was large enough that the bank needed a participant and the first order of business was to make sure that the participant was still on board uh, and they are. And so the response from the bank, so this is a real time deal uh, that was ready to proceed uh, let's just say would have been ready to proceed, but for coronavirus, full speed ahead. You know, get through committee, negotiate the loan documents, and close in the next 45 days. Uh, that's obviously not the time frame that we're under now. Um, and so the response from the bank uh, was the the following: um, first of all, we need to hit the pause button because our credit committee is absolutely inundated with doing triage on existing loans within our existing uh, portfolio. Uh, And the first thing we have to figure out is how to deal with our current customers on existing debt. Uh, And some of these decisions on forbearance or interest only or how to deal with draws or whatever across the whole spectrum of their portfolio are rising to the level of credit committee. And so that time is being taken up with triage. So that new business is, asked, is being asked to take a little bit of a back seat until they can work through the triage side. But the lender came back and they said, we have three basic questions that need to be addressed uh, uh, if and when we get ready for credit committee. And we'll be ready for credit committee. It's gonna take probably two or three weeks until we can get uh, our arms around what we've got going in our existing portfolio, but we're ready for you and we want you to proceed. But you have to resubmit your request uh, and be prepared to specifically answer these three questions. Question number one is we need an updated uh, look at the sponsor slash guarantors uh, financial world. Uh, It's not so much that we have concerns about the new construction deal, which will be delivering and generating NOI 18, 24 months from now, Uh, It's more a concern about what's on their balance sheet and what exposure do they have? Do they own hotels? Do they own retail shopping centers? Is most of their liquidity and net worth tied up in 
tip of the spear kinds of assets as opposed to others that maybe are more resilient in the current environment. Uh, and so your, your sponsors had better be prepared to get us updated, you know, personal financial statements, uh, global real estate uh, own statements, global cash flow statements, and explain to us the degree to which they are exposed on some of these more troubled uh, asset classes. So that's question number one. Uh, question number two is, what is the business imperative that is forcing you to proceed or to admit, has you, have you wanting to proceed uh, with this deal today? Like why, like why now? Why can't you just wait? Uh, and uh, the lender was even so bold as to suggest to me uh, that a bunch of sunk costs in the deal that were burning a hole in the sponsor's uh, pocket wasn't a good enough reason. There had to be a legitimate business imperative as to uh, why it is uh, that uh, uh, the project could or should proceed now, as opposed to waiting until uh, uh, later, some unknown later time. And the third question, uh, which I thought was uh, quite interesting, uh, um, is that what is the contingency plan in place uh, that the contractor has? So the lender wanted to make sure that the sponsor was working with their contractor uh, we're talking about new, you know, ground up construction here. Uh, what's the contingency plan in place from the contractor, you know, to ensure once construction commences, do they have a plan in place, you know, to ensure the ongoing and continued delivery of materials to the job site? You, you know, what is their expected efficiency of labor and availability of labor? If we are, you know, forced to continue to shelter in place, and even though Minnesota has designated construction as being an essential service, you know, these jobs are not operating at 100% efficiency anymore. They're probably more like between 75 and 80% efficiency. And has the schedule been adjusted appropriately? You know, are there OSHA requirements in place? Are there social distancing and sanitation, you know, contingency plans in place for the job site? So that once construction commences, do we have some confidence that it can continue at the right pace? Do we have enough interest reserve built in? Is there enough contingency in the deal? Uh, and so that if we get into a situation where we start to advance loan proceeds because the job is underway, satisfying the equity requirement, can the job continue and proceed and finish on time? And I think some variant of those three questions is going to need to be answered, uh, or each of those three questions is going to need to be answered to get deals to advance. Uh, and that's without getting into just base underwriting issues. You know, as Dave mentioned, you know, if we've been underwriting three to five percent vacancy for multifamily in the Twin Cities for the last seven to ten years, you know, are people now starting to underwrite five to seven or seven to ten percent vacancy just as a safety valve? The deal that I'm working on happens to be relatively low loan to cost anyway, so there's already some built-in cushion in the deal. It's only a fifty-five percent loan to cost request, uh, but beyond just the basic underwriting of a deal and whatever might change because of the current situation we're in, those three questions we're hearing time and again uh, from bank lenders in particular on new construction. You know, how, so how good is your sponsor? Why are we doing this now? And is there a plan in place that, allow that would allow construction to continue? And if we can't answer those three questions, you're not going to get very far in committee. So that's you know something for I think the audience and borrowers to be thinking about if they're trying to advance deals, they should be prepared to answer questions either those ones or ones very similar to those. Todd, I would say that by nature, a ground up construction transaction is complicated, and Murray specifically uh referred to a lot of the reasons why and wh what what became or what's becoming of the ability for that to close at bringing this up to about thirty thousand feet though in general if it's a existing stabilized property at least it was going into this uh i am seeing and i think i speak for everybody on this panel where we have over the years carefully selected our capital sources knowing that in times like maybe in a way in certain in certain ways uh where this has occurred where the market has taken a downturn uh they've delivered and that's what we're known for we're known for delivering 
And so if you asked me about a transaction that was in a CMBS execution, I'm assuming that answer would be much, much different than how what we generally work on on this panel, which is life insurance company or agency. And so I can tell you that anything I've been working on has closed and uh, or is in the process of closing and there's been no indication it won't. Um, I actually have a really wild story about a transaction that did close about four days ago in which we were in the process of a collateral substitution from an industrial property to a, a hotel. And this insurance company, uh, the COVID hit, the hotel emptied out, but they continued with the closing. And we closed on a hotel that was virtually empty when we closed. So they delivered. And that is what we hope will be the attitude moving forward uh, for other transactions that are in closing. And I think I speak for everybody again, that that's generally why we work with the capital sources we work with. So as far as new business, you know, we'll see uh, how that goes here. But we're generally hearing that you know, 60% of those are stepping out of the market, hitting a pause button, so to speak. The 40% that are staying in, saying they'll look at business, uh, you know, are probably doing that with the idea that if it hits on all cylinders and is conservative enough, they'll consider it. So generally speaking, by way of who we've carefully selected as our capital sources, we are getting loans closed and continuing to, to uh, process those. Yeah, I'd agree with Mark, Mark that on the life company agency and even bank side, deals that have been in process have continued forward. We did have a couple fallout with uh, debt funds and those were debt funds that were requiring a, a CLO execution, meaning they were securitizing bonds on the backside, which market really dried up on March 12th. Uh, so we did have a fallout uh, of those. But uh, we just earlier this week had a commitment from a life company on a, a grocery anchored retail deal, similar to what Mark was talking about. Most of the, uh, I guess, outside of the grocer, most of the other retailers are closed but the, the life company is moving forward, issued the commitment, looking to close early next week. Uh, no changes to the terms and at an interest rate that is much lower than they'd see if they were looking at new business today. And uh, banks similarly that we're working on have been continue to go down, down the path without really uh, offering any signs of a hiccup there. And uh, the agencies, uh, deals that are in process, uh, they may have been thrown a, a small curveball, but uh, with some escrows that might be required from uh, from Fannie Mae side. Freddie Mac is a maybe, depending <clears throat> on, it, but uh, they're still moving forward under under the terms that uh, that they're put on your application. So. I have uh, two. Uh, op zone multifamily deals uh, under application with uh, construction perms from uh, from a bank. Uh, we're in the appraisal process right now, hoping to wrap that up and then uh, hope to proceed to continue to close. But uh, I guess the phrase on my side, and I've said to some of the guys in my office, is the deal's never done till the check clears the bank. So we really, you know, just have to continue to listen and structure. And uh, luckily we've been able to do that. But at, uh, my borrowers tell me that they, they need to keep on schedule because they're lining up their framers, they're lining up all their subs, they got material coming that they've ordered. And so they've, they've committed on their side and they're hoping that the, uh, the lender performs as agreed to. Uh, again, coming back to that last phrase. David, do you, when you spoke uh, about the 
appraisal and process. Can you speak to what you believe the dynamic will be surrounding that appraisal and how the different changes might be evolving there in terms of what to expect from the standpoint of valuation? I don't believe at this point that there's enough evidence to start changing cap rates. You know, cap rates lag behind interest rates probably six to nine months in general. If if rates uh, go up and stay up, eventually borrowers uh, cannot offer as much for property, and then we'll uh, we'll see cap rates move. I think it's too soon for this point for an appraiser to speculate because they're always working with historical data. But I think that they're going to start putting in clauses in their in their uh, recommendations on valuations that just state in general that, you know, we couldn't do this. We couldn't get into the property. We we don't know enough at this point. So they might they might uh, ding in a little bit. Well, I, I was I, I, I'm sorry, Dave, I've got a yeah. Mark, I've got an appraisal anecdote uh, for you. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, capital sources. Uh, up until about two and a half weeks ago, I was working on closing a CMBS loan on a hotel acquisition. Uh, and the CMBS market was the only place to go for it. And it was actually very aggressive terms. Um, and so we were working through that process. And uh, the appraiser came back uh, with the completed appraisal uh, that had a coronavirus value reduction uh, for the hmm. hotel uh, in it. Uh, and of course, the lender blew a gas. The fourth approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, <laughs> there just... was, uh, so the, the, um, the income approach, uh, the income approach had in it a limiting, a uh, special limiting condition uh, that was uh, coronavirus related. Uh, and the appraiser um, got to the stabilized, got to the value that would have been necessary to satisfy the LTV requirements of the lender's term sheet uh, on a stabilized value, not the as is value. And the stabilized value was some hypothetical time frame, 18 months after the end of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. That was the stabilized time frame. Uh, and the stabilized value at that time was more than adequate to satisfy uh, the LTV requirements of the term sheet. Uh, in order to maintain loan proceeds. But the as-is value uh, was hammered uh, with this uh, special coronavirus uh, sure. requirement. Uh, and the lender was prepared to go uh, do battle, if that's the right way to say that, uh, prepared to have a discussion with the appraiser about an alternative approach, which is the normalized valuation is this, but if it's coronavirus, it would be that, uh, as opposed to the normalized valuation with coronavirus is this, but stabilized, it would be that. Um, that all worked right up until the bond market blew up, as Joel said, on the 12th of March, and, and the loan just went away. Uh, in this particular case, the client is very well healed and can wait uh, to, to close the loan. Uh, and so it's not the end of the world uh, from a timing standpoint. Uh, they're, they're unique, by the way. Uh, and if it had been a lesser capitalized borrower, they would be, it would be a disaster, would have been a disaster uh, from the standpoint of the capital source. Uh, but uh, we're starting to see, and that, and that was just two, three weeks ago, uh, already into these third party reports to the extent that, uh, you know, coronavirus can creep in, it's crept in there you know, already. Right. Yeah. I mean, relative to the subject matter of value, that's where my prediction is, is that when we kind of get through the storm and we're exiting out of it or navigating, um, I'm not sure that I think that we're going to have any issue with interest rates. I think interest rates will come back in line. Where I think we're going to be needing some balance and, and navigation is the uh, fact that we'll be painted with a brush of conservative uh, LTV. And so equity is going to be key as we move out of this and that we won't be seeing the higher leverage offered. Uh, and when I say full leverage, I'm talking 75%, by the way. And so the more conservative approach, I think we're going to see. 
is going to, we're going to be starting with six handles on LTVs and, and uh, initially probably lower. Uh, once we start getting into a more stabilized borrowing environment and lending. Yeah, I think you've already seen that on the life companies call it that are uh, dipping their toe back in the, in the water and looking at uh, new originations. They're really cramming down on the LTVs right now. That might even be a five handle for most of them. Uh, for, right. You know, 55 type type range and pricing that would seem wide, but um, and I think we'll, we'll see that as always when they're in a price discovery, they, they don't want to be the, the, fir the first in and don't necessarily start adjusting until they lose business that they want to win. And right now, some of them aren't sure they want to win the business. So they're not fighting for it. Yes. But I think at some point the pressure is going to continue to build that they're going to have to put that money. They're going right. to have to, de to deploy it. And they won't, there maybe won't be enough spread in corporate bonds that they're going to come back to mortgages. And so at some point, the dam's got to break. And, and maybe it is the third quarter, but I think that there's going to be uh, somebody out there that's on the life side, especially, that's going to say, you know what? We're, we'll do that. Let's pick off some 50% LTVs on whatever valuation model you want to use. Mm -hmm. And let's pick a few of these off and get some money deployed. Right. But that's why or the fact that we're early in the year and the life companies have have these high allocations to to get money out the door, I think, is why we're seeing them come back so quickly. And I, I was amazed as we started to go into this, uh, how many remained in the market and didn't go really to the sideline until you know the week of uh, week of the 23rd after the Fed lowered their federal funds rate to zero to 25. That's when we saw kind of everything, them, them run to the sidelines. And uh, a, a number of them have come back into the market or, already. So I, I think to Dave's point, there's just so much uh, sitting on their balance sheets that they have to figure out how to, how to put it to work. But they also have to figure out the other side of their balance sheet on their life insurance policies, annuities, where, where are those pricing and how much inflow are they going to have from those products? They were, they had, to, were setting records for the number of, of the other side of their house that they were, were having to go out the door. And that was getting these large allocations. So trying to figure out that side, how much is coming in and so how much do they need to put out? But the liquidity is strong. And with the, uh, you know, the, the $2 trillion stimulus, the, four plus billion that the Fed has put into the market. That's just pushing more and more uh, theoretically liquidity into the market that has to land somewhere. If you think, of, if you think about the market absent coronavirus, you know, lender behavior as we approach the peak or the top or the end of a cycle, you know, in the, in the past, what we've seen is that behavior as you approach the end of the cycle, lenders break one of two ways uh, in, in, in preparation for a, an ultimate business cycle downturn. Some lenders would say, let's get more conservative. Uh, let's lower our LTVs. Let's tighten up on our underwriting, uh, but let's price aggressively to go get that, you know, low hanging fruit or that, you know, conservative business. That would be one way lenders would break. The other way lenders would break as you approach the end or the peak of the cycle would be, you know, let's take let's take on a little bit more risk so that we can get some yield. Let, let, let's find ways to find more yield at the end of the cycle here, uh, uh, being judicious about taking on risk, but getting paid to do so. I think that that was sort of the environment that we were heading into for 2020 at the beginning of the year before coronavirus sort of disrupted our markets. Uh, and I think as we recover from that, coronavirus will amplify that um, bifurcation in the market. And I think the, the natural place for life companies to go uh, would be to that conservative side of the, uh, of the world. Low, let's lower LTVs, let's tighten up our underwriting. Uh, but because we have a lot of liquidity, if we have to go price in order to win some of that, you know, good quality business, uh, we're going to. And some of these other lender classes 
when we come back out of this, who are generally uh, more uh, favorably viewed in markets that are dislocated. Uh, so debt funds or CMBS or whatever, there'll be a market for people who are looking for lenders who are willing to take on more risk. And they might hit the bid on slightly you know, more aggressive pricing from the lender standpoint, more unfavorable pricing from the borrowers. They might hit the bid in order to get the leverage that they're looking for, for a quote unquote riskier deal. And so I think heading into 2020 as the business cycle extended, we would have seen that behavior anyway. I think coming out of uh, the COVID and the recovery, that'll be magnified in Q3 and Q4. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are two components that drive the way we do business, uh, at least the folks on this panel, and they, that would be non-recourse and long-term, long-term being north of 10 years. And the sources that we're talking about that we met with at the MBA collectively, would you guys agree, there was probably $80 billion being offered to us to dis to, to deploy in one in one annual year. Is that is that consistent with what you heard? Yep. Yeah. That's so they, they need they need to put this money out. At least they had an intention of putting it out, just as they do each year we go down there. Uh, this hit, and now they have to think about how they're going to maintain that level of capital that it's available. And David's point is at some point this is going to break. And at some rate, they're going to put it out. And at some LTV, I just think they'll put it out. We're going to start seeing it continue to be deployed. Obviously, right now, they're being extraordinarily conservative. And our rate environment right now, by way of, you know, uh, a month ago, looks a little wide. But we're still talking about 4% today. Uh, in my years of doing this that's still incredibly attractive it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily resonate with folks that were borrowing at sub three a month and a half ago but but it's it's it certainly resonates with people that were doing you know six seven eight percent rates 25 years ago so we're not this is not doom and gloom uh from the standpoint of where rates are and probably will be after we get out of this, it's just going to be a more conservative borrowing and lending environment. That's what it is. And frankly, it's probably a correction because we were starting to ride a wave that was getting unsustainable. And so I just think if, if people have faith in where we'll be, in you know the, the the near future by way of relative timing, let's just say the end of the year, that that the brilliant minds in our country are gonna figure out from a scientific perspective how we're gonna solve for this vaccine and or therapeutics. We'll get our economy back going, but without question, the way this is gonna happen, at least in our world, is you're gonna have to be poised calm, confident, based on that notion that we will get through this and that we're going to be, you know, it's going to be extraordinarily important to work with those that we're currently uh, uh, having issues with relative to current borrowings and that they too realize that we're all in this together. So I said this the last time we had this, this panel webinar in that it's really going to be a key component of getting through this, that people remain calm, re recognizing that we'll get through this and that cooler minds will prevail and reasonable minds will prevail. Um, you know, the elephant in the room right now is, oh, if I, you know, ask for forbearance right now, what, how will I be viewed in the future in terms of credit and financial disclosure? Well, I mean, logic would tell me that, that, we're going to look back and this is going to be an exception to what would ordinarily have been a problem, giving back, working around a property that didn't work for much, for, for much different reasons than COVID virus. So to a certain extent, I would say to somebody, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to put that on the credit disclosure statement when you do your exhibits, but 
there's a pretty darn good story here that that we're going to be able to rely on that isn't necessarily going to be the same or reflective of what would ordinarily have been the case should you have given a property back or had some kind of workout. Um, you know, the other elephant in the room is the governor, of course, has um, mandated a moratorium toward eviction. Well, right. But, you know, there's there's this belief that we're going to have tenants that are going to not be able to legitimately pay their rent. There's going to be tenants that won't pay the rent because they know they can't get evicted. But, you know, I think I actually heard today of a north of 10,000 unit owner that said, you know, out of their entire portfolio in the last month, you know, 2% have said they aren't going to be able to pay the rent. You know, whether that changes next month, we'll see. But I think people in general, if they're getting paid, if there's a way that they're still on a payroll and can make their rent, they're going to make it. I think that generally speaking, we should expect and hope that in general, people are uh, are going to do the right thing as a tenant, as a lender, and as a borrower. I think in general, they're going to do the right things and we'll get through it. All right. Uh, we have one quick question from the audience. I want to get them. We'll let everybody else recap. Uh, the first question is, uh, and I know, I think, Mark, you mentioned you were doing some prospecting for new clients. If there was a loan type that were most attractive right now today, uh, what property type would you uh, be going after? Uh, a grocery store. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm, um, I would assume that at the right leverage levels, uh, anybody on this call or anybody on the panel would suggest the same that we should still be able to consider apartments, multifamily, uh, again, at the right leverage levels and the right structure. Uh, you know, uh, an industrial facility that that is has a, you know, a legitimate multi-tenant uh, uh, ro roster with with good, strong, historically uh, acceptable uh, tenancy. Uh, you know, I, I there, of course, there's the the obvious. I mean, clearly a hotel today is not something that anybody's going to take a look at, or for that matter, a, a retail strip center. Uh, but I, was, I wasn't kidding when I said grocery obviously is very uh, important, essential business today, despite being retail. Uh, if it's a good, solid grocer with uh, potentially a grocery anchored center, you know, depending on the other uh, occupants. But, um, uh, you know, in terms of those asset classes, I mean, office, that's a, I guess that's a little more difficult to, to answer. Um, I, you know, cause I, I actually, I'm not even sure where we're gonna end up here after this is all said and done when people have gotten used to working from home. I mean, it may change us, that, that may be create a new dynamic in terms of what we're gonna be looking at from the standpoint of office, I'd be interested in hearing what others think, but um, th that that would be my general response to new business. I think I'd state it similarly. The you know before going into this, you really had three groups that probably were that stood out from the others: multifamily, industrial, uh, true distribution, industrial, and then uh, gross anchored retail. And I think that's still the case, and the gap has probably widened a little bit. That the the preference for those three has it's kind of separated itself from office, hotel, and other. I'm we are. Also, oh, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I, Dave. I was just going to say that uh, two other property types that have popped up on a list that I've heard uh, as well as medical office buildings and self storage. Mm -hmm. That those might not be as impacted from this. Uh, as others. I would agree, David. We are at 11 o'clock. If you guys want to keep going, I'll, we can add another five, 10 minutes on. Does anybody have any more questions? Uh, put it in the poll, in the, I'm sorry, in the chat area. And uh, final thoughts from anybody on the panel. The, the one thing that I was going to bring up 
uh, for the viewing audience would be, uh, and this has come up in, in numerous conversations with my uh, existing customers. Um, if you are out there as a borrower or somebody that's consulting a borrower, um, I would suggest to you that before making decisions about lease modification, uh, that you'd first let your lender know what you're up to, because there is a possibility that if you start modifying things without consent, um, that there is a way to come through the back door in terms of non recourse carve-outs, because you've basically uh, defaulted when making changes that weren't approved. So just be careful about what you're uh, thinking you want to do based on a tenant's request without giving notice to the, uh, the lender. By the way, Mark, I uh, just posted on LinkedIn yesterday uh, an article that had been uh, running around uh, within our company that an attorney had posted and I asked for permission and he gave it to me. So it's out on LinkedIn. Uh, and it, it does specifically uh, mention how doing things with your tenants uh, without permission, you should be reading the fine print of your, of your carve outs, your bad boy carve outs to see what you can and can't do. And uh, maybe even actually getting a legal opinion so that you, you stay in your lane and don't convert your non-recourse loan into recourse. Right. Yeah. Any other parting words of wisdom? Hearing nothing, I'm going to sign us <laughs> off. I want to remind everybody uh, that we at the Minnesota Real Estate Journal are committed to helping you get through this and creating webinars so that you can continue to get information and connect with each other. We have more seminars coming. We have a really big one on next Tuesday with Dr. Dotzer, the economist from uh, Texas. We already have well over a thousand people registered for that. So make sure you get that info and sign up for that one and watch your emails. We'll continue to be promoting these. Uh, address questions about continuing ed. Uh, Jeff Johnson and a coalition of other people are working on uh, some new sort of regulations with the Department of Commerce that we can fast track some of these webinars um, to try to get you continuing ed uh, to, before the season's up. They have said that they're not going to extend the deadline at this point, uh, but that remains to be uh, an item of discussion. Again, thanks everyone. We're recording and we should have a link up uh, if you missed part of the presentation. Uh, thanks to all of our presenters. I'm going to flip through their slides quick one more time while you're uh, all logging off. And, and thanks again, everybody, for their time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Yeah, thank you.